Good afternoon. I'm Vin Weissakowskis, and join, excuse me, joining me is my daughter, Heather Locklear, who assisted me with creating this presentation. Back in the 70s, I used to collect U.S. stamps and started learning about postal history. For the next 30 years, I amassed a collection of over 4,000 pieces of Connecticut post offices and postal history from the period of 1762 to 1880. Around 2000, my collecting interests changed and I started getting more interested in the lithography of the Civil War and started collecting predominantly unused Civil War patriotic envelopes, mainly because the unused or used, postally used from military or from battle scenes drove the price exponentially. And they usually they showed battle scenes, officers, or poked significant fun at the South. I now have over 6,000 different varieties. And in some cases there would be, there's, I'll get to it later, there's a catalog. It's uh, the Weiss catalog. It was done in 1995. And there's cases where he would reference a specific design that may have had some sort of a verse under it. And he would issue a different catalog number if one was printed in red or one was printed in blue. Or if one was on a yellow envelope or a pink envelope. So the variations are endless. I'm finding cases with a specific design on the front. I can find five different uh, typesets for the imprint of the printer on the back. Basically, every time they did a press run, they would change them. So it just goes on and on and on. So in 2000, I started attending the ephemera shows, partly with the graciousness of Mr. Harris, and started wandering down the side roads of song sheets, letter sheets, and different things that were produced to decorate the home that I refer to as wall art. Charles Magnus was one of the most prolific printers of the war and he was comparable to Courier and Ives in the quality of his work. And he amazed me on just how much he actually printed. I went too fast, I'm sorry. Right here. Regarding my topic of, topic of profiting from the war, there's not really a lot of information in print regarding the true profitability of the war. There was an article that appeared in the Ephemera Journal of 2010 by Rich McKinstry, who later went on to write the book on Charles Magnus. In his article, which was more of a biography, he references the census records of 1860, showing that Magnus had a personal wealth of as $1,000 as a station. Ten years later, in the 1870 census, Magnus was listed as a publisher, and at that point his wealth was supposedly $5,000 in a time when the average day's wage was only 50 cents. In the same journal, Erica Pioli did an article regarding the women and children at the home front and their bombardment of all the stationary of patriotic designs. To quote her, the Civil War compelled the printers, engravers, and in lithographers in the major northern cities to shift the content of their printing materials. These tradesmen needed to acknowledge the new, excuse me, the new social climate and consequently altered acts of consumption, 
driven by the economic and emotional factors of war. As a result, a staggering amount of patriotic prints pervaded the visual landscape of the North. The home front became inundated with recruitment posters plastered on fences, lithographs of sensational battle scenes for sale, and material of assaults, excuse me, smaller scale, such as envelopes, souvenir novelties, and paper toys that were printed of patriotic themes and sold and issued by stationers. Elsewhere in Erica's article, she makes reference to the material that constituted a fad and how many made it into circulation during the war of a, during the year of the craze remains a question. According to a June 1861 newspaper article in the Philadelphia Inquirer, the envelopes had created an economic windfall for the engravers, stationers, and some of the printers who had no cause to complain for a lack of business. Philadelphia stationer and printer William Mann had no cause to complain about his sales. His profits increased 50% between 1861 and 1862 and 40% overall from the beginning to the end of the war. Her, also, her, excuse me, her article also goes on to explain the different area stationary packages or kits that were available at the home front and forwarded to the soldiers in the field because the military general stores or sutlers were charging exorbitant rates and in many cases were not available. A lot of these packets, the average price was 25 cents, and in some cases, depending on the quality or content, they were almost a day's wage, but it was the only way they could communicate back then. So, <coughs> excuse me. So with this intro, let us start a journey through the ephemera print, through, through ephemera that was printed during the war. Thank you. Now I'm taking over. Seat. No, I want you to slide over. All right. So the we started with foundry print blocks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, and these were made from metal or wood to be used with the typeset to print the envelopes in either single or two color. So here you see Phelps and Dalton foundry print block with representative envelopes. And here's some more, courtesy of Fred Barron. Um, so these are different print blocks. Different vendors. Different vendors. Do you want the laser pen? Can everybody see it legibly? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Here we have printer trade cards, um, more like a business card, and uh, our printer trade card with a representative of the printer. So you see here Fred Kimmel and King and Baird. King and Baird, I will show something else soon. So these are more printer trade cards, Francis and Luttrell, Sage Sons and Company. Here's Harbeck and Brothers. The envelope at the bottom left is beautiful, but to show the imprint, I had to turn it upside down. So it had to be turned, for if you didn't hear, it had to be turned upside down to show the imprint. And then we get to the salesman samples. Salesman samples were distributed to stationary stores so they could purchase bulk quantity. And this um, as well sample sheet that you see here. This, the, the designs were printed on envelopes. The designs were printed on envelopes. 
And he, here is, as he referenced, um, the King and Baird sample sheet. This is courtesy of the Library Company of Philadelphia. Technically, I own the top copy. There's a story there. Years ago, the day I bought this here, one of my dealer friends asked me why I bought something with a hole in it. And my response was, you find one without a hole, I'll pay your price. <laughs> 10 years ago. The adage is, if you see it, you buy it, you can always upgrade. So in this case, the library company, I was able to digitally download and lay my original over it. It's in the back of the room. If you look close, you'll see the eagle and shield is cut out. So next we move on to stationary kits. Stationary kits were sold to people at the home front so that they could write to family, friends, and soldiers at the war, at the war front. They usually contained multiple sheets and envelopes with a patriotic design, or they were plain, and in many cases also included a pen or pencil to go with them. And jewelry. They were catering to the women and jewelry because they were catering to the women to write to their soldiers in the war. So the one that you see here is from Gibson and Company. And then here we have Mumford and Company and C. Bone. Bon. Bon. And here we have Magnus's half dollar portfolio. This here cost almost a day's wage. The interior envelope also carried advertising of other products that were available to the public. Song sheets were used by the families to sing along to when they got together at home or those in the soldier camps at night. And so we have a couple different varieties that we'll be showing you here. There's some from James McGee, and then quite a few from Charles Magnus. I tried not to make the whole presentation Magnus. I could have. So here is the Magnus Love Thee song um, seen here on the left-hand side, it shows five varieties of the same song with different vignettes, and he did this to attract more sales. So it was the same song done five different times, and he could sell it and make more money that way. And he, at the bottom, you can't see it on these, at the bottom he referred to 500 varieties, one from column A, one from column B, and he mixed them all up. And then on the right are the military and patriotic songs, and this was an accordion style of six different song sheets. So then we move on to patriotic letter sheets, like those shown here and on the next few slides. Um, they included a patriotic design and then blank lines. These are, yes, sorry, these are Charles Magnus. Um, before was James McGee. There's, and the, the ones that aren't labeled here are also Charles, Charles Magnus. There were quite a few. Displayed here are printed labels for an accordion file that was engraved by Haynes, printed by Nathan Sawyer, and distributed by Whitmore. And for pa here, um, seen here are patriotic albums. The same two labels. And it was an accordion style holder for a hundred patriotic envelopes. Each of, each of the pages had two slits where you could mount two covers back to back and when full would hold 100 covers. 
Do you want to say something about here? Oh, same concept, no printer in it. So this vendor was unknown. The printer was unknown here. So the same concept as the one we just showed before. And here is a union scrapbook. I'm going to send that out and get it bombed. Here is a contemporary scrapbook. This contemporary scrapbook number two was owned by Bates Wally, and it was created January 10th, 1862. It is one of the three that my dad owns. Can you read it there? The, the paint newspaper? Okay. Um, so, well, I have it. So okay. this is an opening cover for an exhibit explaining how they were already promoting collecting as a hobby. It reads, a collection of union envelopes in a few years from now will form a most valuable and pleasing curiosity and will be sold at double the original cost. I, I wish it was only double. <laughs> oh. Carbell was from Hartford, Connecticut, where I grew up. So here's the catalog that my dad was referencing earlier from Weiss. In the introduction of this book, Mr. Weiss references 6,000 varieties within the book. He also lists 230 different names appearing on envelopes that are either printers, engravers, or retailers. Of the 6,000. You have to talk into the microphone. Within my, excuse me, I got too close. Within my collection, I probably have four to 500 that aren't even in the book. Everything in the book was relevant to him looking at other people's collections. And from my understanding, he was a contrary old man and didn't want to, didn't want to cover the price to look at somebody else's stuff. So he didn't see everything. There's a lot of cases where there's verses that aren't listed because of that. There were, there were common designs like an eagle and a shield, and it could be 20 or 30 different by the verse that they wrote underneath. So I'm still trying to find them all. I've heard referencing that there's over 10,000 varieties. The next few slides show small groups arranged by topic from 56 different chapters within the book. Seen here are Washington and Lincoln. This group is General McCullen and General Scott. This group shows some subordinate generals, so not as famous. This group shows battle scenes. This group is military scenes, but not battle scenes. Or referencing the girl they left behind. This group shows camp scenes and army hospitals. This group shows caricatures of people or animals poking fun at the South. These chapters account for 20% of the total catalog. This group is more caricatures, um, but not about poking fun about the South. The interesting one is the one at the bottom, where when it's right side up, it so shows the interpretation of Jeff Davis. And when it's upside down, it shows a jackass coming away from battle. So one the one on the right is the right side up, and the one on the left, the one on the left is the donkey. This group is obviously flags. And this group is eagles. And lastly, this group is allegorical figures. Animals. 
Rosenthal printed large regimentals on number 10 envelopes. Yeah, on the back of number 10 envelopes. And then he also printed them on larger format paper and hand painted them with a border and sold them as wall art. This wall art by Charles Magnus is named the Glorious Victory at Richmond, April 9th, 1865, showing the surrender of Lee and ending the Civil War. Lastly, I, my dad, would be remiss in forgetting the daily newspaper that was providing information by telegraph to inform the public of the happenings on the war front. This is the Hartford Evening Press on the evening of April 15, 1865, announcing the assassination of President Lincoln that morning. He was assassinated Friday night. He was assassinated Friday night at the Ford Theater, and he passed away approximately 7 a.m. on Saturday morning across the street in a private residence and then this was the newspaper announcing that. So that concludes our presentation. Do you want to do questions? Okay, I think we have time for questions. I will not be answering such questions, so you might want to come closer. Yes. Oh, we have the, they have the microphone, but you have to get closer to the microphone. Hi, that was so, is it working? Yes. Uh, so this is all about the Civil War. I don't see any reference to slavery or the appearance of blacks in any of this. We're living in a different time period. I tried to keep it out as much as I could. I, so it exists? It, oh, yes. Okay. More so than the satirical things. Okay, thank you. But some of them were not appropriate. Right on time. That's right. Good. For the um, the patriotic album to which you would add the patriotic covers. The accordion style. The accordion style. Yes. Um, do you know when they started selling those and how long after the Civil War they continued to market those? I can't answer that. I'm 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 more of a pack rat collector than I am a student. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality of it. I buy something, put it in a drawer, and look at it every, every six months. That's if I got enough money to keep buying things. But no, I, I, I want to say, well, there was actually some patriotic designs th that existed before the Civil War, before Sumter was bombed as things were leading up to it starting. Afterwards, it probably continued because there was a great promotion as a collectible and scrapbooking. I want to say that I've only shown Union here. I probably have two to 300 unused Confederate designs. And between what I've read and talked with other dealers, probably three quarters of them were printed after the war as a collectible, not relevant to the war. So most of the ones that I have, the only way I could prove them would be to find a representative copy, postally used, dated during the war. But most of mine are all unused, so I just, I don't know why I buy them, but I just keep throwing them in a box. Yes. Microphone? <laughs> You're getting your steps in. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, I've seen uh, a number of albums, uh, scrapbook type albums, of the artwork itself on the envelopes clipped and pasted in. Do you have any uh, familiarity with that as a kind of a popular hobby or anything else to say about it? We didn't have anything else to do at home. I don't know. <laughs> the, the one that I showed by Bates, Bates Wally, I purchased three. Over time, I stripped one of them for the collection. The one you saw was intact. The third one were all silhouette cutouts with brown mucilage glue. To, to waste the time to soak them, there's no value. So I just leave it the way it is, contemporary to the war. But yeah, they did. It could, it could have been a child that entertained himself instead of school or whatever, who knows. So, Vinny, what's your most exciting find recently? That's a, that's a loaded. Well, one of the, my most one of my most was the King and Baird, the salesman sample. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, that that's one of the. Unfortunately, it's got the hole in it, and I'm waiting for somebody to find me a good one. <laughs> Good luck. I don't. I don't recognize her because the picture I have is from 2010. I've been talking with Erica Pioli. There you go. Well, the picture in the journal was from 2010. Um, it's amazing the amount of quantity that's at the library company that was all donated. By John McAllister, contemporary to the war. And it's all pristine. The original undermine was lifted from that. I just purchased a broadside that I, it's up in the back, you, you could look at, with a McAllister name for a store. And sitting in the other side for me to get tomorrow, I purchased an eight and a half by 11 of 12 different tickets admitting people to the sanitary fair. And McAllister's name is one on one of them. So yeah, they're, they're all exciting. Unless I open the door or my, my drawers and I find I already have one. <laughs> then I go, crap, I didn't need it. That happened with me, with Ken Fleury. We have a show in Hartford twice a year called Paper Mania. I've got over 180 song sheets by Magnus alone. I'm not going to take them with me. I photocopy them. They're five and a half by eight. I put them in alphabetical order. Got a rubber stamp for copy. And I bring them to the shows. He had one of Lincoln on a song sheet. My copy wasn't in alphabetical order. I bought it. Got home and I go, gee, I know I got it. I started flipping the pages, flipping the binder. I called them up Sunday morning. I said, I already had that. Can I send it back? Yeah. So yeah, you just, that's the only way I can remember that, what I own. There's no way I can with the, with the Patriotics. With 6,000, I've got 32 shoe boxes, figure of speech. They're they call them memory boxes at Michael's. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there, there's some memories. Yes. So there's no way. Well, basically, most of the dealers I do business with, they're usually doing a two-day show. I don't go farther than two hours from home. There's a show coming up, stamp show, Postal History, in Boxborough. I'll see the dealer on Friday. He just purchased 4,900 
unused patriotics to last summer. He's, broke, he's the only one that breaks them down by catalog. I bring home a section being already numbered. I can buzz through them. Saturday, I bring them back and settle up with them. That's the safest way. In the back, I've got three framed prints, the newspaper, the salesman sample, and the glorious victory at Richmond. And I've also got two binders if anybody wants to thumb through them, because you get on a break right now. <laughs> <laughs>